Whenever you're ready. Okay. okay. We're coming to you from Doers of the Word Baptist Church this morning at 14781 Sperry Road in Newberry, Ohio with the zip code of 44065. I'm Pastor Ernie Sanders, and you're listening to us this morning on the Liberty Works Radio Network. That is the Eagle 104.3 FM in Tampa and Ocala. And the title of the message this morning is The Tribulation and the Two Witnesses. The Tribulation and the Two Witnesses. So we started in Matthew chapter 24, and this is going to probably take me two weeks to preach this message. And in Matthew chapter 9, I mean, verse 24. Matthew 9, verse 24. Daniel. 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 Boy. Don't confuse me more than I are Right. <laughs> Anyhow, I just confused our piano player. Anyhow, it's Daniel and in his chapter 9 and verse 24. I've got that right now. And we're going to take a look. Now listen to what he has to say. This is the purpose of the tribulation period. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. Now thy people here are, are, is the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel. He's referring specifically here to the nation of Israel. And upon the holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sin. So first of all, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquities, and to bring everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and the prophecies, and to anoint the most holy. So we're going to take those one by one. And what you're going to see here is that with all of these people that continue to try to put the church into the tribulation period, the scripture says the Lord is returning for those who are looking for his return. And uh, I got a feeling that some of these people that are just determined on putting us through the tribulation period uh, are going to miss the rapture. I think the Lord's going to just leave them there so that they can uh, go through that tribulation period if, if they want to do that. The Bible makes it very, very clear that God is not the author of confusion. He tells you he condemns in Isaiah chapter 5 those who put bitter for sweet but good for evil, so, so on and so forth. God does not punish his children. Okay? God does not bring the wrath of his wrath upon his children. He makes it very clear. And so we start in Matthew chapter 27. I got that one right. Matthew chapter 27. And I want to read verses 45 through 50. Now, when we go back to finish that transgression, now it was completed for the church, the Lord Jesus Christ completed all of these things that I just mentioned, those five points, have been completed in the church. They have not been. They're yet future for the nation of Israel. Now we start in verse 45. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, asabachthani. This is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard this said, the man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of, the, one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it in a reed and gave it to him to drink. The rest said, let it be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. So Jesus, when he had cried out again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Now, what, when he had cried out, he had cried out, it is finished. And we turn over to uh, Matthew 17. Oh, I'm sorry, make that, I make that John. Turn over to John chapter 19. John chapter 19, verses 28 through 30. John chapter 19, verses 28 through 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all the things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be filled, said, I thirst. And there was set a vessel of vinegar, and they set up on a sponge with vinegar, and they put it up on high set, and put it in his mouth. And when Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now, 
year again to finish the transgression. It was completed. It was completed through Christ for the church. And then if you go to John 17, verses 1 through 5. Now here you'll find that he finished his work of teaching and witnessing of the Father, of himself, and of the Holy Ghost. Now redemption and salvation would be done at the cross. And we start in verse 1 in chapter 17. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hours come, glorify the Son, and thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all the flesh, that he might give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know that thee and the only true God in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So, here again, now this is prior to him finishing uh, the work of redemption and salvation on the cross. But here he has finished his work of teaching and witnessing of the Father himself and the Holy Ghost. And again, remember, the first point of the tribulation period was to finish the transgressions and it was completed in the church, yet is still future for Israel. Now, the second point was to make an end of sins, to make an end of sins. And if you go to Romans chapter 8, and in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, we read this. But well, actually, I'm going to have to read a little bit more. Yeah. Christ paid for our sins, past, present, future. Uh, you can't lose your salvation, but you can lose your rewards in heaven. And how do you lose your rewards in heaven? By ignorance and apathy. By ignorance and apathy. By not paying clear attention. This is the most important thing that will ever matter to you. The only thing, that the time will come, as we often say for everyone. The only thing, the only thing that will matter to you is your standing with the Lord. And when you enter into eternity, you're not going to be caring about all of these worldly things you have out here today. You're only going to be concerned with your standing. Amen. And we read here in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to make them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. Remember here, the second point was to end, to make an end of sin. For the law that could not, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And then I want to take you over to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Because in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, remember the third point that he made, the third point that he made was to make reconciliation for iniquity. To make reconciliation for iniquity. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I want to start in verse 17. Now, God has reconciled himself to the world and has given us you see this is what a lot of people don't understand you see, this is confusing well if you listen carefully to what I'm about to read it's not confusing at all to, to, to simplify it you and I if you're saved we're ambassadors for the Lord our job now is to go out and reconcile sinners to God Amen. you see He's reconciled himself to them, but they haven't been reconciled to him. Why? Well, they need to hear the gospel. They need to hear the gospel preached. The gospel of their salvation. So he says, uh, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who have reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and have given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, 
that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Committed unto us, us. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ stead, be reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be a sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So, that has been completed for the church through the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's and we're still doing that right now. You see, that doesn't apply to us. All of this applied to the nation of Israel. And there are those out there, and I know a lot of your covenant theologians will try to preach that God is finished with the nation of Israel and that we have become the new Israel. We're not the new Israel. No. We are not the new Israel, folks. There's still our prophecy that has to be fulfilled in the nation of Israel. That's right. And they have still not received Christ as their Messiah nationally. No. Amen? Amen. So, so we want to go, uh, remember what he said, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Okay. And I want to go back to verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray. You and Christ did be reconciled to God. No. So that was to make an end of sins, to be reconciled for iniquity. And the next point is to bring everlasting righteousness, to bring everlasting righteousness. That everlasting righteousness has been through Christ to the church. And if you turn over in Romans, chapter 3, starting in verse 21, Romans 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and prophets. So what does that say? That verse makes it really clear, right? But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For they have all sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through the faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, the righteousness that he might be just and a justifier of him who believed in Jesus. So here again, uh, to bring everlasting righteousness, he said it is done. And then turn Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on those things above, not on things on earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil, impissual, concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things, for which things, sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which you also walked some time when you lived in them. But now you also have put off all these things with wrath, malice, Blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Let not one lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him, whether there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, that Christ is all and in all. So uh, he's talking about that the 
to bring the everlasting righteousness. Uh, it makes it clear it has happened. The church now has taken place. They said this is not a future thing. And the, the whole purpose of the tribulation is what we're reading here. He gives you very clearly in Daniel 9.24, this is the purpose of the tribulation period. Now, and again, it is to bring Israel to repentance. It's a purification period for the nation of Israel, not for the church. The church has no place in the tribulation period. And then... Uh, he talks about to seal up the vision and prophecy. To seal up the vision and prophecy. So, I want you to go to uh, Ephesians 1. And in Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Now, this applies to the church. In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. In which the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, until the praise to the glory. Now remember, to seal up the vision. The vision was for what? Salvation, eternal life. Okay, that's the vision. To seal it up. It's been sealed up in the church. It's already been done. Again, in which is the earnest of inheritance until the redemption of the birth of possession, until the praise and of the glory. And then if you go over to Ephesians 4, verse 30 through 32. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all the bitterness and wrath and the anger and the clamor and the evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. And then the last point is to anoint the most holy. To anoint the most holy. And I go to 1 John chapter 2. And in 1 John chapter 2, Verses 27 through 29. But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. But you know what? I want to go over first before that uh, to verse 20. Let me go to verse 20. But you have an unction. That word unction means anointing. That, that's the same as the word anointing. You have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Right. Verse 27. But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and of truth, and is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him that we shall appear. We have confidence not be ashamed before him that is coming. Amen. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Amen. So the last point is to the anointing of the Most High. The anointing of the Most High. And then if you turn to Revelation 5. In the Revelation chapter 5 verses 9 and 10. Revelation 5, 9 and 10. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And hath made unto us our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Well, those are the tribulation saints. But also, uh, remember... When John got to heaven, he said, who are these these people? Okay. But through the church, through Jesus Christ, it's already been done. We've, we've already achieved that. So the tribulation period is for the purification period of the nation of Israel. It is not for the church. There's, there's no place in the church. Let me ask you something. If you had two children, and one of them uh, was very obedient, 
and one was very disobedient, would you not reward the obedient one and and not reward the disobedient one? That's kind of sense. And why in the world would God, when he tells us throughout the Bible, that his wrath is not for his people? Amen. That his wrath is not for his people. And yet there are Thank people that just continually say that the church is going to go through the tribulation period. Now, as far as the two witnesses, I might have, how much time do I have left back here, John? 25. Well, I might have time to get through this thing, okay. Now, you have the two witnesses, and people, there are some people that think that the two witnesses um, is, is Enoch and Elijah. Okay. okay. <laughs> But what does the Bible teach? And that's what we're going to get take a close look at. Now Enoch is a type of the rapture church. He's a type. Uh, in fact, if we go uh, and we read in Genesis, let's start in Genesis chapter 5. We'll take a look at Enoch in Genesis chapter 5. Now, you're going to see here something as, as we take a look at now. In here, during this period between Adam and Abraham, the Lord is dealing with mankind. Because up at, up at this time, there is no nation of Israel. There is, and in fact, at this time, when we're going to be reading, uh, there's just one nation upon the earth. And later, they're broken up, uh, as we read in Genesis chapter 11. But look. Uh, Enoch was the seventh from Adam, and uh, he comes right midway between Adam and Abraham. And we read, starting in verse 21. And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begot Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah three hundred years and begot sons and daughters. Now they keep saying Methuselah was the longest living man in the Bible. Well, uh, Enoch outlived him. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now, you see, what is that a picture of? Well, we'll read that, a picture of the rapture of the church where the Lord takes those that are still alive, and he brings them up. And then if you go over to Jude, I want to take to Jude, verses 14 through 16. Well, first I want to go with Jude 9, starting with verse 9. And Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him any rallying accusation, but said, The Lord rebuked thee. Well, here, uh, the body of Moses we're going to take a look at that as we get closer to that. Uh, there was something very s special about the body of Moses. What was it that old Satan knew? Okay. Uh, and we'll take a look at that. Was that that? Why did he want the body of Moses? What could he have done with it? I mean, most bodies you put them in the ground, and then there for a little while they kind of become worm food, right? That's not the case with Moses. His body was preserved, and Satan wanted it. What if you could inhabit the body of Moses? Do you think he could really lead a lot of people awry? So, if you go to Malachi, I want to go over to... <coughs> well, let me go to verses 14 through 16 while I'm there in Jude. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied to these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among of all their ungodly deeds, and they have ungodly committed, and all of their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouths speak of great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Well, again, he was preaching. In fact, this was the first prophet. He was preaching uh, of the tribulation period. He 
It was preaching about the tribulation period. So, again, what did Satan know about the body of Moses? And, uh, and why did God preserve it? Let's go over to Malachi, in Malachi in chapter 4. <coughs> Malachi chapter 4, you're going to notice something here. Okay. <coughs> Malachi was a prophet to Israel. And uh, he was, it was a prophet midway between uh, Abraham and Christ. Or not Malachi, I meant to. Elijah, Elijah was. He was a prophet between, uh, right in the middle between Abraham and Christ. And so Elijah prophesied, he was a prophet of Israel, of Israel. But we start there in verse 1. For the, behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and the proud, yes, and all that do with you shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto them fear thy name, and shall the Son of Righteousness arise with a healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. In the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses. Now you'll notice something here. Here Moses and Elijah are they are part of being the law givers. Remember you the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him, and Herod, for all of Israel, with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn in the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So you'll notice that they have Elijah and Moses here are mentioned together, right here. And again, uh, as you see here, they're a type of the law and prophets. The Moses and Elijah are a type of the law and prophets, where Enoch, again, was a type of the rapture of the church. Remember, uh, Enoch was not a Jew. The tribulation period has to deal with the Jews. And so we go to Matthew chapter 17. In Matthew chapter 17, and this is the Mount of Transfiguration, verse 1. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter and James and John his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and reigned as white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elijah talking with him. So here's the second time that they're mentioned, Moses and Elijah together. Now Moses appears right there with Elijah. Then answered Peter, and by the way, why? Well, he had been preserved. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Well, yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed him. And behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear you him. He's making a very clear point. And because of the, the way he made that point, Peter and the others were, were frightened. Why? Because the Lord didn't want him, the Father, placing Moses and Elijah on the same level as the Lord Jesus Christ. He was their creator and their redeemer. And that's why he said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. It makes it very clear. But again, you have Moses and Elijah appearing there in the physical, right there at that point. Now, if we go over to Revelation chapter 11. And in Revelation chapter 11, I want to read it. Well, verses all the way through 1 through 15. 
And it was given me a reed like unto a rod, and an angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles in the holy city, shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Uh, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God on the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeded out of their mouth. Now remember here, fire proceeds out of the mouth. Well, we're going to take a look at it because Elijah, that's what Elijah did. Enoch never called any fire down out of heaven, but Elijah called fire down out of heaven. We'll take a look at that here in a minute. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeded out of their mouth, and devoured their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must, in this matter, be killed. For these have power to shut heaven, and it rained not in the days of their prophecy, and their power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all the plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city with spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. How much time do I have, John? Thirteen. Huh? Thirteen. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move a little faster then, okay? I want to go over to Deuteronomy chapter 34. And in Deuteronomy chapter 34, Verses 5 through 8. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley of the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. And Moses was a hundred and twenty years old when he died. His eyes was not dim, nor his natural force abated. In other words, Moses was still in pretty good shape when he died. Okay? And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days, so the days of weeping and mourning were ended. Well, I want you to go now to 1 Kings chapter 17. And in 1 Kings... Chapter 17, starting verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, you shall not be due nor reign these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, turn the eastward, and hide thyself in the book Cherith, that is before Jordan. Boom. So here now, Elijah had the power to stop the rain. He had the power to stop the rain. And if you turn over to 2 Kings chapter 1, Second Kings chapter 1, starting with verse 10. And Elijah answered and said unto the captain of 50, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consumed him in the fifty. And there came down fire from him, and it consumed him in his fifty. Again also he sent him to him another captain of fifty with his fifty. And he answered and said unto him, O man of God, thus hath the king said, Come down quickly. And Elijah answered and said unto them, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume him in thy fifty. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him in his fifty. And he said again, a captain of the thirty, of the third fifty, with his fifty, and the third captain of fifty went up, and came and fell on his knees before Elijah, and brought him, said unto him, O oh, man of God, I pray thee, let my life, and the life of these fifty servants be precious in thy sight. And there came fire down from heaven, and burnt up the two captains of the former fifties, and with their fifties, therefore, let my life now be precious in thy sight. 
And the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, Go down with him, be not afraid of him. And he rose and went down with him unto the king. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, For as much as thou hast sent messengers to inquire of Baal-zebub, the god of Ekron, it is not because there is no god in Israel to inquire of his word. Therefore thou shalt not come down off thy bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. So he died according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah had spoken in Je Jehoram, reigned in the stead of his second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehosh, the king of Judah, because he had no son. And the rest of the acts of Isaiah, which he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So now you see here, Elijah had the power not only to stop the rain, but to bring down the fire, to bring down fire and devour people. And that's exactly all of what we just read in Revelation 13. These are the signs of the prophets. Now, if you go over to Exodus chapter 7, Exodus chapter 7. And we start with verse, we read verses 20 through 25. <coughs> and Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded and lifted up a rod and smote the waters and were in the river in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of the servants and all the waters that were in the river were turned into blood and the fish that was in the river died and the river stank and the Egyptians could not drink of the water of the river and there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt and the magicians of Egypt did so with their enhancements and Pharaoh's heart was hardened neither did he hearken unto them as the Lord had said and Pharaoh turned and went into his house neither did he set his heart to this also and all the Egyptians digged around about the river for water to drink, for they could not drink of the water of the river. And seven days were fulfilled after that that the Lord had smitten the river. Well, again, he tells you that one of the two witnesses will bring plagues down upon the people and will turn the water into blood. And that's exactly what Moses did here. And then if you go over to uh, chapter 8, we were to read here starting in verse 5. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Aaron, stretch forth thine hand with thy rod over the streams and over the rivers and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come upon the land of Egypt. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enhancements and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron, and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go, that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. And Moses said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me, and I shall entreat for thee, and for thy servants, and for thy people, to destroy the frogs from thee, and the houses, and that they may remain in the river only. And he said, Tomorrow, and he said, be it according to thy word, that thou mayest know that there is none like unto the Lord of God. And all the frogs shall depart from thee, and from thy house, and from thy servants, and from thy people. They shall remain in the river only. And Moses and Aaron went from the Pharaoh, and Moses cried unto the Lord because of the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. And the frogs died out of the houses of the villages, and out of the fields, and they gathered them together into heaps, and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, 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 he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Well, there you go. So here, that's exactly what he tells you what these two would do, is exactly what Moses and Pharaoh had done. Now, uh, again, I wanted to say that. Uh, Moses uh, and Elijah, they are types of the law. They deal with the nation of Israel. Enoch was not a Jew. Enoch was not a Jew. And he is representing the church. And so what happened to him? He was not 
he did not die. He was caught up alive. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We read, starting with verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now people say, well, I don't understand that. If you die, I thought you'd go and, and you're waiting to be resurrected. People, we are triune pe people. We are triune beings. We have a body, soul, and spirit. Our soul and spirit go home to be with the Lord upon our death. Our bodies rest on the ground. So he's bringing us with him back here. He doesn't come to the earth. He comes to the first heaven, and our bodies are raised up and joined together in the air with our souls and spirit. And we become immortal at that time with glorified bodies. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with, a vo with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and we shall ever be with the Lord. So he was taken up alive, and that is again representative of the church. He's a, it's a type of foreshadow. There's many types in the Old Testament of the coming church of the New Testament. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, that is he's referring to. I want you to go back and... Uh, and, and you'll notice this is uh, in the dead in Christ. This is the day of Christ. This is the day of Christ. This is where so many uh, people get very, very confused okay, uh, about the between the day they, they don't make, uh, they don't understand the difference between the day of Christ and the day of the Lord. Okay? The day of Christ always deals with salvation. Christ is the Redeemer. He's the Savior. He's the Comforter. He's always deals, he's the Christ, the Messiah. The day of the Lord always deals with judgment. The day of the Lord always deals with judgment. Uh, chapter 5. But of the times and of the seasons, brother, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as to veil upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are the children of light and the children of the day, and we are not night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith, love, and for the helmet, the hope of salvation.